Welcome, everybody. If you're just logging on, we're going to get started in uh, oh, somewhere around 38 seconds from now, give or take. Always amazes me how long a minute takes so you're waiting for it to click. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started then. So, hey, everybody, this is Lars Light from the Psalm Journal, welcoming you on behalf of the Psalm Journal, the Psalm Foundation, and the New Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia. Well, I am on mute, aren't I? No, I'm, yes, I am. I am not. Good. There we go. Let's start over again. Hey, everybody, this is Lars Light from the Psalm Journal, welcoming you on behalf of the Psalm Journal, the Psalm Foundation, and the New Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia by National Geographic Publishing. Welcome to our last edition of Winery Close-Ups. Uh, the last of our webinars in this educational series. Today's theme is sustainability, down to earth with best practices. And this is in collaboration with the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance. Uh, this is being recorded. It is on Facebook Live. Then uh, you will also find links to it on psalmjournal.com and psalmfoundation.com. And there will be a printed recap in the August, September issue of the Psalm Journal. Uh, if you're not already a subscriber, please drop me a note at Lars at psalmjournal.com and we'll make sure you are a subscriber. Um, great informational content and you're going to get a lot of great information today. We've got a wonderful panel lined up for you. And what's fun is with our alliance with the Psalm Foundation, we have even more reasons for you to pay attention today. Uh, some great incentives. And to tell us more about that, I'd like to welcome Lynn Fletcher from the Psalm Foundation. Hey, Lynn. Hi, Lars. Thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, thanks to you and the Psalm Journal and all of our panelists for making uh, this uh, opportunity possible for our students today. Um, so within the next couple business days, we'll do a random drawing uh, to select eight of you to receive access to our Psalm Geo program for one year. Uh, so we'll be reaching out to those lucky few of you soon. We are also having an essay com competition, so um, make sure you pay attention. We're going to be posting the recording of this on our website in the next couple of days, as well as on the Psalm Journal. But uh, we're going to do a competition. The top two winners of the essay competition will receive a copy of the new Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia. And our first place winner is going to receive a check for $1,000. This is a grand prize session. So um, make sure you pay attention and uh, we'll send the essay prompt out by uh, the end of the day on Monday next week. Make sure to check your spam filter if you don't receive it. And the essays will be due by May 2nd. So good luck everyone and we'll see you later. Thanks Lars. All right, thank you Lynn, all those dreaded spam filters. So I don't know about you, but I think uh, everyone here would agree that we are living in a golden age of wine for trade and consumers and individuals. I think that more and more wineries I'm noticing are really going back to their roots and being concerned about the environment, the people that work for them, the way the wines are made. Um, and it's, uh, it's, not, it's harder and harder to find any what you used to call greenwashing. It's a lot of wineries taking uh, sustainability very serious. And I think there's never been a better time to be a wine lover. Uh, maybe there will be in the future if, it's, if it keeps going at the pace we're going. Uh, so on that note, I'd like to introduce Lisa Franchoni, who is Programming Director for the California Sustainable Growing Alliance, to give us a little bit of an overview of what's going on in sustainability. Welcome, Lisa. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I work for the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance. So for many years now, um, have worked on our sustainability education and outreach programs. So I'm really happy to be here today to share a very brief overview of what's been happening in California around sustainability. So really quickly, I'm sure you are all very familiar with the California wine industry, but to really set the context of 
the sustainability commitment, it's important to recognize that California is the fourth largest wine producer in the world with over 4,000 wineries, close to 6,000 wine grape growers. Um, and really when you talk about the commitment to sustainability within the industry and you recognize just the scale that we're talking about, um, you can really see the positive impact that can happen um, with so many wine grape growers and wineries really committed to sustainability. When we talk about the definition of sustainability, um, sustainable wine growing and wine making, we're really talking about a holistic approach. Um, so it's looking at conserving natural resources, protecting the environment, um, but also equally important, enhancing wine quality and enriching the lives of employees and communities. Um, and then of course, looking at the business itself and safeguarding family farms and businesses, not only for today, but for generations to come. Um, so again, it's really about a holistic approach. It's using comprehensive practices, science-based practices, and really looking also at continuous improvement. So recognizing that there's always more that a vineyard or winery can do to increase their sustainability and improve over time. With sustainability, everyone benefits. Um, and so for sustainable certification, it really is providing a third party verification that many, many rigorous practices are being implemented. Um, and these practices are good for the planet. So we're talking about conserving energy and water, protecting air quality, building healthy soils, um, looking at the broader ecosystem, many, many things that are good for the planet. Um, but like I mentioned, things that are good for the community. So practices that are ensuring a safe and healthy workplace, um, practices that are really encouraging um, workers and staff to get involved in the sustainability efforts and also good for the community. So how are wineries and vineyards interacting with their neighbors, with their broader community, um, not only by protecting the land and conserving resources, but through philanthropy and many other things that are good for the local economies. And like I mentioned, very important that all of this is good for the grapes and wine. So, you know, using sustainable practices really requires higher attention to detail um, that does result in higher quality grapes and therefore higher quality wine. And you can't talk about sustainability with also without also talking about organic, biodynamic and regenerative. Um, and I really like to think about these um, as all being on a common mission. So the simplest way to think about it is that any of these farming approaches are fantastic. They're all working towards a collective goal to really leave things better than they were found. Um, so there's a lot in common. They're all really trying to build and support healthy soils, healthy vines and ecosystems. Um, all of these now with the regenerative organic certification program that exists um, are structured into formal certification programs. So there's a set amount of practices that need to be adopted. They're all verified by third party audits, which really gives them all credibility that you, again, to Lars's point of greenwashing, you can trust that these people are indeed doing the sustainable practices that they claim they are doing. And then of course there are differences, different areas that are emphasized in the different approaches. Sustainable practices do tend to have a broader scope with things like energy efficiency, supply chains. Um, they do include wineries. So there's sustainable winery certification specific to again, all of the conference conservation efforts, et cetera, efforts that are happening at wineries. But then of course, organic, biodynamic and regenerative all go into greater depths in other areas such as soil health um, and grazing and integrated pest management, et cetera. And really within California, um, California wine grape growers and wineries are global leaders in sustainability. Um, California is home to the world's most widely adopted sustainable wine growing programs. Um, with more than two decades of history behind that, of sustainability education and certification. And so this is a really critical point. I think um, not only working for an organization that's been doing this education for over two decades, um, but that wine grape growers and wineries are really supported in these efforts. So it's not just about, about a bunch of standards that are audited against for certification. It's really about having educational workshops, um, sharing best practices through tools and resources and really having the support that wineries and vineyards um, can rely on to really help improve their practices over time. 55% um, of California vineyard acres are certified sustainable to one of the different programs. Um, and over 80% of all California wine is made in a certified sustainable winery. So again, we're talking about a very large impact from the fourth largest wine producer. And we've been doing this now for over two decades, so we're really trying to talk more about these efforts and um, one a great way to talk more about it is through our Discover California Wines website, 
um, where you can go and get a great overview of sustainable wine growing. What does it mean? Um, you can learn more about the Down to Earth Month campaign, which is our way to celebrate California wineries and vineyards. And many of them also have events that take place like vineyard tours and winery tours focus on sustainability, winemaker dinners focus on sustainability, many great things that you could check out on that website. And then we also have this really great sustainable wine growing ambassador course. It's a free online course, only takes about an hour, but it's a really great way for you to get in and learn really what are the different practices that are being talked about within sustainability. And you get a nice little certificate to be able to share. But again, it's just a great overview to really dive a little deeper into what is sustainable wine growing. And then we also have a website, californiasustainablewine.com, which is focused on the California certified program. Um, and there you can search for certified wineries, certified vineyards, and certified wines that actually have that logo on the bottle, if that's what you're looking for, but also a great place to learn more about sustainability and be able to actually look and go visit some of these certified sustainable wineries. And really, you know, as wine trade and consumers, how can you get involved? Um, really, the best thing is to support these vineyards and wineries who are doing, you know, the hard work on the ground to really be committed to sustainability and adopting best practices as best they can um, by looking for sustainably grown and made wine. There's lots of ways to do that by checking labels um, on wine labels on winery websites. You can also, when you're in wine country, see lots of certification signs in vineyards and tasting rooms. So lots of ways to really find out, you know, who are the wineries and vineyards behind all of this great work. It's many of them within California, as I've mentioned. So um, please do get out there and, and support some of these certified sustainable wines. And that is it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you to CSWA for all the great things you are doing. And thank you to all the wineries behind it who are uh, making such wonderful wines for us. Great. So uh, to take us around this sustainable world, uh, we have the gentleman who is responsible for Samgeo. Uh, I'd like to call it Google Maps goes to wine country. Greg Van Wagner, wine and beverage director at Park Aspen, founder of Ajax Cellar, and he is the creator of Samgeo. So Greg, welcome and uh, tell us a little bit about our journey today. Great, well, Lars, thank you so much. Um, yeah, today we're gonna be going through um, sustainability in California through Samgeo. We're going to uh, go throughout California um, and really you know, thinking about this, California has always been a leader in sustainability. Um, and particularly as, you know, one of the nation's largest wine producer uh, really has an outsized role. We'll be going through Mendocino, Sonoma, Napa, uh, down to the Livermore Valley, down to Monterey, and then down to Paso Robles. Uh, but first, we'll, we'll kick it off in Mendocino. So up in the north of California, um, always have you know, had a big focus on organic and biodynamic farming, um, getting quite a bit of influence from the ocean. Here we have um, Ontario right in the Russian River Valley, uh, kind of have a, a lot of temperatures to work with here and a lot of versatility in the vineyard. Um, we're going to be talking, you know, the Bonterra and the Fetzer portfolio has always focused really strongly on sustainability. Um, Butler Ranch, I think, is a great example of that. And uh, as you'll see in the next photo, really just a beautiful, beautiful spot. Um, but I'm excited to hear more about uh, everything and back to Lars for more. All right. Thank you very much. So uh, as I think you mentioned, we're going to be starting off at Thomas George Estate in the Russian River. Do you want to uh, hone in on that one or did you do that? Are we there already? For sure. We can go down to uh, there right now. So yes, in the Russian River Valley, Thomas George Estate. Here we have uh, Sonoma, also big influence, um, well known for Burgundy varieties, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, and the Russian River Valley is really, um, you know, the classic region for that in Sonoma and definitely takes care of a lot of the, the lead as far as the national recognition for those wines. And here we are, Thomas Georgia State, right on West Side Road and right just close to the Russian River itself. All right, Lars, back to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Greg. So our first speaker is Nicholas Cantacuzene. I have to see if I slaughtered that name for him or not. Um, but he is the winemaker for Thomas George Estates in Russian River. Uh, he's worked with fry, um, dry farming. Uh, I know he worked extensively at the Meredith Estate, and he is now 
uh, at Thomas George with the goal of completely converting the vineyards to dry farming. Uh, unfortunately, he, Nico could not be with us today, but he and I did have a great conversation yesterday that we recorded. So I'm going to, going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll pick up on the great conversation I had with Nico. If I can figure out how to make it go. There we go. But so sustainability uh, starts with choosing the right piece of land, and the right property. Um, obviously, if you were to farm in the desert, uh, the inputs would be a bit different. Um, so um, I feel like I. Oops. At uh, Thomas George, uh, we have a particular want to focus on one of our vineyards that is uh, an ideal vineyard for their, uh, sustainability and um, dry farming. So we we have worked. Uh, I've converted that vineyard to dry farming about when I came here. It took about two to three years. Uh, the vineyard is in Forestville. We have four properties, uh, but the one in Forestville is the centerpiece of the dry farming um, uh, agriculture. And I'm trying to little by little uh, convert the other vineyards. Not every vineyard is. Um, um, you can convert them to, to a dry farming, but uh, you can get there. So it might take a little longer, but um, uh, the goal is to get there. Um, so what we have at, um, at um, a property called Cresta in Forestville is about 14 acres, uh, about 10 acres on Pinot and four acres on Chardonnay, all dry farmed. And what allows the dry farming is, so the, at, at first when you're not used to dry farming, is you cut the, little, the water little by little and the, uh, what you don't realize is the plant knows what to do without you. You know, she, the vines have been evolving for thousands of years without us and they know what to do. So it's a bit of a shock at first because the berries tend to, to become uh, a little smaller, uh, which is what we like. And so you do lose a little bit of yield when you go to dry farming, but the plant uh, tends to adapt quite a bit to the environment and uh, that knows what to do and everything becomes a balance. And as a farmer, it's actually much easier for you to manage it. So what we've done is, um, is just cut down the water over a period of one or two years and the plant knows what to do. So what we've seen in that is the berries have become smaller uh, but and, but the flavor is more concentrated and we haven't had to thin as much the fruit because it's in balance. The canopy is not as big, so it doesn't need as much water or it doesn't need, it knows what amount of water it needs. Uh, and then, um, yeah, so for the water system, it's, it's really easy. And during the heat spikes, it's even, even it does better than the counterparts that have water. Because uh, what happens is during the, the growing cycle, the vessels in the in the vineyard tend to become larger in dry farming vineyards. And so they know where to get the, the water from versus if you do the typical California style of farming, you will do frequent irrigations and that that brings the vineyard in, um, it becomes dependent on the water. And so without the water, the vine collapses because it doesn't know what to do. So I feel like this is a, a big part of my culture and what I bring to the vineyard is just weaning off the water because we're going to have less and less, obviously. Uh, we have to, gonna have to learn to, to live without it. Um, and so that's one input. The other input is we, because we're in gold-rich soil, uh, the, you have the sand layer on top and the clay at the bottom. So it's a natural source for the, the, the roots to tap in. And so what you wanna do with uh, dry farming is let the roots grow as deep as they can so they know where to look for the water. And so you wanna encourage that. And so usually you you cut the superficial roots and then the, the, the roots, the deeper roots go in, in naturally into the soil. Uh, the other thing we've done for sustainability is we uh, have imp implemented cover crops and where I'm, I'm, I'm um, uh, so we have grasses that sequester 
carbon, and then we have the legumes for um, nitrogen. Um, and so this gets tilled naturally into the soil. And ultimately we, we were hoping to get a no-till um, cover crop that will naturally uh, die out and feed the soil by itself. So that's the ultimate goal we have to get there. Uh, the soil will allow that and it's very much in balance. And so we don't use fertilizers or anything like that in this specific vineyard because it does not need it. And we're starting to implement this program. So like anything, it's just not immediate. It takes time. And so it's uh, at least a three to five year process to convert all that. Um, <coughs> and then in the vineyard, I'm talking specifically about this, this vineyard and then I'll talk about the other vineyards. So, um, so we don't use water and don't use fertilizers. <coughs> we do prune a little bit. Um, and uh, in the vineyard side of things, in the, I mean, the winery side of things, I don't um, inoculate um, and for either uh, uh, yeast or bacteria. That's just a personal choice. But uh, over the years, again, I felt like, especially for peanut, if you have the right nutrients that's been imparted into the soil, all that is in balance. And um, you can, the better the fruit, the more likely you can uh, not add yeast, right? If you know your fruit well, it's uh, much easier to be uh, native, uh, non-inoculated for yeast and bacteria. If you have sound fruit and sound practices in the vineyard, um, you can do that. Um, so over the years, I've I've been more and more comfortable with uh, native and non non inoculated yeast in, in the in the uh, uh, winery side of things, and never had an issue. Just because at the upfront in the vineyard we did did all the work, all the nutrients are are in line, everything is is, is done right in the vineyard side of things. And that is what counts. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Nico. Sorry, we had to cut this conversation a little bit short there, but uh, a lot of very valid points. So, Greg, where's our next uh, stop on this sustainability tour? Greg, are you there? I am here. I am here. Um, so, yes, we are talking um, Thomas George. We don't see you, Greg. Oh, there we go. There we go. I'll share my screen up here. Uh, we'll run through. We'll go back through, um, talk about... Uh, Hunter and Butler Ranch, uh, all the great work that they're doing in, in Mendocino. Here we have, so just on the top of the Russian River Valley, uh, Mendocino, of course, always has a great history of working with um, organic and biodynamic practices. And down to Butler Ranch, uh, a great example of the, the company's overall focus, um, really beautiful vineyard just here in um, Mendocino. We're back to Lars for more. Thank you very much. So next up, we have Joseph Brinkley, who's Director of Regenerative Farming for Fetzer Vineyards, and he's going to discuss Fetzer's Butler Ranch project. Joseph, welcome. Good morning, afternoon. Thanks, Lars. Let me get to the screen here. All right. Great to be with y'all. Great panel today. So appreciate the invite. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Butler Ranch, uh, one of our single vineyard wines, uh, organic and biodynamic certified, and then our overall business approach to sustainability. Start my timer so I don't get cut off, Lars. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Next slide. So here we got a nice overview from Greg. Thanks for that. We're looking really to the right of the screen is south towards Hopland. This is inland Mendocino, right along the 101 corridor. Uh, up to the right, you see Blue Heron Ranch, which lies adjacent to the Russian River, uh, the Russian River. As we come north on the corridor there, we have this little lovely little box canyon there to the right where McNabb Ranch sits, uh, about six, 700 feet elevation. And then the focus today is at the top of the mountain. So here, Butler Ranch Vineyard sits atop the mountain. Uh, about 750 acres, but 86 planted. And uh, a little smattering of examples of our certifications down there in, in the bottom right, certified California Sustainable um, Vineyard and Winery. We're certified in about five of our ranches through uh, Biodynamic, through the Demeter Association. Everything we farm in the county is certified organic and most recently now, uh, the Regenerative Organic Certification. So, 
dialing into Butler Ranch here, like I said, about 750 acres is what we own, but uh, the, the terrain is quite challenging, um, complex, impressive in some ways. <laughs> so these are lovely little map here we had with uh, the varietals planted and you can see the blocks and orientation and such. So that kind of longer blue um, space there, the Zinfandel is right on top of the ridge. And then as we go down the mountain on all the different sides, this is kind of how we've been able to carve out a few different blocks, um, really able to take advantage of rootstock, bridal choices with orientation and aspect and such. There's a lot of, a lot of variety here. So now if we dig into this specific blend, hopefully you got some in your glass there, Lars, and it's amazing. The 2020 Butler, this is uh, what we would call a more Rhone inspired blend. So these are the blocks we typically will source from every year for this blend. Grenache Syrah Mavedra. This is the category is made with organic and biodynamic grapes. Therefore there's uh, some additives that are prohibited. So for us, you, you see some Petite Syrah in the blend. I know that's not typical on, on the Rhone blend, but for us, we had amazing color, really inky color from the Petite and some nice uh, additional structure there. So. The blend will shift through the years as far as the exact percentages, but we're really looking for constant, constant quality, consistent uh, profile there. And now we're gonna take a little step back. So our approach to business is kind of how we approach farming. It's really like a, a community, you know, relationships, um, as we're in relationship with the land, the plants, the animals, we really, apply this to, to the business approach. So here in the middle, you see we're a certified B Corporation. This really allows for us to embrace broad business transparency. Um, and there's multiple pillars, uh, environmental community governance, how we treat our people and, and the impact we have in the world. Then to the right there is our climate neutral certification. So we've certified two of our brands. This is at the brand level, which for us is really important because it, it helps to bring our consumers and our supply chain along. What climate neutral requires is monitoring and measuring of our carbon impact, and then reducing that impact all along the supply chain, scope one, two, and three of emissions. And anywhere we're yet to, we're not yet able to reduce or eliminate, um, we're required to purchase offsets. And our focus has been on nature-based offsets specifically. We really feel that's important to, to, to get to the offsets through, through nature-based programs. And then here on the left, uh, most recently, we, we've certified 100% of our Mendocino Estate vineyards, as well as the winery uh, through the Regenerative Organic Alliance. So we were able to obtain the silver uh, certification. There's three levels of regenerative organic. Um, and so in, in addition to focusing like the organic and biodynamic certifications on, on soil health, integrating animals into the farming system, using cover crops and compost and, and you know more living, I would say, types of fertility, there's a, a pillar here that's the, the social pillar within the regenerative organic certification. And, and this ensures that our workers are treated fairly or compensated well with pay and benefits. And, and, and there's a, a grievance process as well if they have concerns or issues that they wanna bring up. So all of these certifications for us are, are really important such that consumers and, and everybody knows, you know, there's, there's a, a high degree of transparency and a really high bar that we're being held to through these third-party certifications and, and audits. And now one more step outside um, as we continue to go broader, we've realized in this kind of community relational approach, it's important for us to do all we can within our own local business and local communities, but we're at a really critical moment, um, if you haven't noticed, right, with, with climate. So, so for us, we, we really find it crucially important to also work in the realm of advocacy. So the last few years now, we've, we've really stepped up the advocacy work um, at the local, the state, and even the national level, advocating for policymakers to make some bold, decisive choices, um, take some strong action on supporting, you know, climate type legislation, whether it be electrification, the grid, the transport sector, um, or really supporting regenerative agricultural practices. There's, there's a lot of support. There can be a lot of support. So we find it really important to use our voice as business to, to encourage our lawmakers, our policymakers to really start, start 
stepping up and, and making some choices. You know, we, we do all we can. You see all the certifications. We've been zero waste and recycling and solar power and on and on, you know, but at some point we, we need policymakers to, to, to step up too. So um, I really uh, blew through this. I got 30 seconds according to my timer, Lars, but um, yeah, I, I really appreciate everybody's time. It's a great panel. Love to be in, in good company with other folks. And um, thanks for your attention and your, your time today. Great, thank you, Joseph. I'll use your uh, I'll use the remainder of your 18 seconds to just uh, say thank you, to Fetzer. You guys were a uh, a pioneer, uh, historic producer in uh, in leader in organic and sustainability, and that's awesome. And I love the way that it's evolved, taking it to the next steps, really taking social responsibility seriously. So kudos to that, and cheers with a great wine. I'm, I I love every grape in that blend. Uh, sort of a Rhone type blend and the wine has got beautiful bright fruit you can tell it comes from a very live vineyard um, great great earth tones to it very nice wine so thank you for that congratulations Thanks, appreciate that all right Greg next stop next stop is Napa Valley um, so obviously very well known um, American wine region uh, but also doing a ton for sustainability um, in particular we're going to be talking about uh, um, Dollar Hyde Ranch. I just think this is a really great example to uh, to point out the San Supri. Uh, really beautiful estate going from 600 to 1100 feet above sea level. Um, and just a, a, a great example of really beautiful viticulture up there. And over to the San Supri um, winery over in Rutherford. Um, really love these wines, love what they're doing. And uh, back to Lars to hear more. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So uh, with us now, we have Michael Schultz, who is VP of Winemaking and Vineyards at St. Supri Estate Vineyards and Winery. Uh, he is sixth generation winemaker from the Barossa Valley. Uh, Michael, you know, you've six generations. I, I'm guessing that you may have seen sustainably, sustainability almost come full circle in, uh, in all those years and generations. Yeah, yeah, Lars, look, I, you know, I grew up on a vineyard uh, in, in the Barossa uh, and as a kid, I uh, spent a lot of time out in the field. That's how I earned my pocket money. Um, but yeah, it was interesting. Uh, I'd uh, lean across the fence and talk to a guy. There was a guy up there called um, Colin Kurtz who um, had been farming the property forever. I mean, he called his he called his young garden, he called his young young Shiraz vines, um, his young garden, and they were 40 year old Shiraz vines. So he'd been around for a while. But um, one of the things he used to talk to me about was the fact that uh, his father who'd farmed had taught him to farm to the phases of the moon, which is really quite interesting because we go around that, we forget about that, and then we come back and we talk about it again. So yeah, I've seen a little bit of that. <laughs> All right. Well, tell us more what you guys are doing at St. Super. All right. So what we'll do, um, uh, just let me get my timer started here as well. So I'll tell you a little about St. Super and, and what we've been doing and what sort of activities we've been doing over time and continue to. Uh, and, and we, we at St. Supri uh, are Napa Green uh, land certified as of 2008 and, of course, winery certified as of 2012. We're also fish friendly farming certified and more recently have enrolled in the International Wineries for Climate Action Change. Um, it's an important part of what we're about and uh, we've been sort of trying to walk, um, walk the walk and talk the talk for quite a long time. So in, uh, in our efforts today, we'll talk about water, uh, energy, sort of pest control, recycling and erosion prevention is uh, part of the task here. So talking about water on our, on our big ranch at the Dollarhide uh, Ranch, um, the majority of the water there is generated by capturing rainwater from runoff. Uh, this is stored in the lakes and used through the seasons. Um, with that water, we make efforts to uh, use it efficiently and by, by the use of things like soil probes, pressure chambers, evapotranspiration measurements, and they're used in, uh, in all these efforts towards efficiency. Uh, we're also increasing the number of fans we have in our fields to reduce the amount of water use usage during that um, ever important frost season. From a wastewater perspective, um, we've, we look at winery water use and in efforts to increase our water use efficiencies in the cellar operations, we had to identify those areas. In doing so, we installed 11 flow meters uh, to record the use and the history in all of our departments. Uh, this allowed us to focus on key areas, and one of those areas, probably the most significant, was our barrel washing uh, facility and the wastewater that it generated. So we upgraded our equipment there to improve efficiencies. Uh, we've, of course, 
that along with all the other areas we've identified will manage to reduce our water use in the cellar by 50% over the last five years. Well, then with what water we do um, generate, uh, we treat, of course, um, with oxygen and bacteria, and then we reuse that in our landscaping and what have you. So there's just some examples of that. When we roll to energy, um, over the past seven years, we've been generating um, some amount of power for our facilities. Uh, <clears throat> we've now expanded to three different solar panel arrays. And over this last year, we've offset our energy use by 92%. We're looking to increase that uh, as we go forward. Uh, and we're hoping that we'll have an 100% offset uh, this year. If you're interested in that, you can actually go to our, go to our website at saintsubri.com slash sustainability, and you'll see our real-time generation, uh, which we also display, of course, here in our taste room. We've done other things from an energy point of view, such as in, improve our light bulbs to more efficient bulbs. We've, been, we've uh, installed motion sensors in our cellars, our bar rooms, our warehouse. So when there's no activity, we're not burning power. From an integrated pest management situation, um, at St. Super, we're in a state brand. and We farm over 500 acres of vineyard. However, having more than 1,500 acres in total, uh, and that's allowed us to encourage wildlife and bird life corridors and efforts for, to farm our lands in a friendly sort of coexisting fashion. Consequently, uh, we cite everything on the properties from rabbits to deer to bobcats, occasionally a bear, uh, mountain lions, of course, being caught on cameras. So they're all amongst us and we, we encourage that and, and, and enjoy and appreciate that. We do have over 100 bird boxes for owls, bluebirds, bats, um, and raptor perches, all placed sort of strategically through the vineyards. The owls and the raptors, of course, deal with vertebrate pests. Um, bluebirds eat the likes of leafhoppers, bats eat mosquitoes, et cetera, and what have you. So all, we're all doing this in, a, in some sort of effort and goal to achieve some sort of natural balance. Um, and of course, it's ongoing. We're always trying to move towards that direction. From a, raise, from a waste uh, reduction and a recycling perspective, we take on some activities. Um, of course, we compost all of our grapes, our stems, our leaves, uh, landscape clippings and, and food scraps as well from our, uh, our garden program and food program. <clears throat> from a recycling perspective, all of our bottling materials uh, are recycled. That'd be cardboard, plastic, pallets, glass, capsules and corks. And then from the choice of packaging materials, which is important to us, um, of all of the boxes we use, we use 92 uh, hours. We have six pack boxes and 12 pack. On our six pack, we can, uh, we've managed to source materials that are 92 to 100% recyclable. And on our 12 pack, 50 to 70% recyclable. With our glass, uh, we buy everything. Uh, all of our glass are purchased from North American suppliers. And <clears throat> we've, over time, continue to try to find glass selections that reduce the weight in our bottles. Uh, and for example, a nationally distributed Napa Valley Estate Cabernet Sauvignon, we managed to reduce the bottle weight on that uh, glass by 7%. The closures, we use natural, cork, natural corks for red wines, uh, but for our whites, we use plant-based carbon neutral corks. And um, we've expanded all, all of our white wines, our seven white wines, since 2019 forward with this cork, which is, a, you know, one thing is from uh, an earth-friendly approach, but the other thing is actually we are wine makers and our goal is to make fantastic wine. Um, these corks have actually given us an opportunity to choose oxygen transfer uh, rates, which uh, can be beneficial to our wine making. And that's been a real positive for us as well. So we've had, um, that's been a great illustration of where we've managed to have um, a positive effect from sustainability impact and also from our wine quality. From a soil health perspective, we keep, as mentioned, about two thirds of our land in natural habitat, and that's all an effort to encourage biodiversity, to encourage biodiversity. While grapes and wine are, of course, our focus, um, in an effort to avoid a monoculture, we're searching to diversify our farming uh, and with that, we've planted over 1,200 heirloom fruit trees um, and they supply our food program. We actually supply some restaurants around town uh, in that 
Uh, and we're you know, looking for and considering more opportunity for diversification of farming as we go forward. We add back compost in the soil to all of our parcels. We seem to be increasing that all the time. We use cover crops, of course, between the vines with a mix of cereals and grains and legumes for biomass production. Um, every 10th rows and sectary mix with, to encourage a good pest balance. Terrace and hillsides are not cultivated to prevent erosion. And they're seeded with an erosion control mix as needed. Um, and at this point, our terrace vineyards generally have a permanent stand or resetting native grasses. We're increasingly using um, uh, mechanical weed control under the vines with vine mowers and clemming weed, weed knives. Um, and when we have an, when we can, we uh, we we grazing sheep uh, in an in an effort uh, to improve our land, um, keep them tidy, but also it reduces our tractor usage as we go forward. From a um, carbon from a carbon plan, um, we've we've done we've done an audit over the vineyard. And we've taken into account the vineyard practices, layouts, fuel and electricity usage to calculate CO2 production versus sequestration. As of the audit in January 22, we're sequestering 1,400 tonnes of carbon dioxide between our two properties, Dollarhide and Rutherford. Um, the goal is to improve that number. And the factors that, can, um, that we can do to improve that is, you know, no-till um, and uh, applying combos, no-till, et cetera. We have a green team that's made up of our employees at the, at the winery in all departments. Um, they all participate and also carry the message forward to the rest of the, the company, which we think is very positive. Um, and, you know, of course, we have community outreach on local, national, international levels where we focus on the support of children, charities, underserved populations, health awareness and education foundations. And I could go on, but I see that I'm already out of time here, Lars. Yeah, I can't hear you, Lars. What I told everybody, I was guaranteed I was going to make that mistake again on the, on the mute. <laughs> Thank you for noticing the time. I appreciate it. And uh, you guys have done some absolutely saintly things. So thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate it very, very much. And congratulations on the efforts. The wine's beautiful. I'm tasting your uh, Elu, beautiful, super deep fruit wine, uh, jammy, earthy, really, really nice, gorgeous effort. Nice selections. Thank you. All right, Greg, I'm going to ask... Um, St. Super to stop sharing. And Greg, if you can tell us where the next stop on the sustainability schlag is. Absolutely. So we are headed to the Livermore Valley, um, just inland from San Francisco, uh, also benefiting from a lot of the cool air, the fog coming in from the Pacific. And Livermore Valley, uh, you know, has seen a lot of interest in recent years, but really has uh, one of the largest or one of the longest grape growing histories in California. And headed down to Wente Vineyards, uh, one of the classic names in uh, California and United States winemaking, of course, very well known for the Wente clone of Chardonnay and uh, definitely have quite a bit to do with the history of California and United States wine in general. And with that, Lars, back to you for more. Great, thank you very much. And I'm gonna introduce Andrew Lynch winemaker and head of quality at Wente Family Estates. Andrew, I know I'm throwing you a curveball because I thought the order was going to be a little different, but uh, we appreciate your being here. Uh, Wente, of course, is a sixth generation family uh, property, uh, certified, sustainable. I'd love to hear a little bit about the directives you get from the Wente family and, uh, and how you guys are carrying that out. So welcome. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Andy Lynch. Um, I am a winemaker at Wente and uh, head of quality, and I'm here to tell you about Wente's efforts in sustainability, um, and I want to thank you for showing up for sustainability and making it important in your lives, too. So, a um, little bit about the history. Wente Vineyards has been in business since 1883, farming uh, grapes and making wine. Uh, out of the Livermore Valley ABA. Uh, sustainability is part of the DNA of the family and the company. Um, and some, you know, we have lots of evidence of that, but some uh, one little interesting tidbit is that Eric and Phil Wente, uh, a couple of the brothers, helped draft the code of sustainable wine growing practices for the California Wine Institute. Um, 
it's actually sustainability is written into the mission and values of the company. So we have a daily reminder um, to ourselves of how important it is. Uh, clearly, it's important for the economic viability for future generations, but um, it's it's our daily commitment to our community. It's our daily commitment to um, our workers and um, to the environment. Uh, one noteworthy um, aspect of our sustainability efforts is we're certified through the sustainable, California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance. Uh, I know you heard Lisa speak earlier. And uh, fewer than 10% of wineries are certified in both the vineyard and winery. Wine tea is one of those. So we're very proud of that. Uh, and it has a litany of requirements, um, as I think you heard Joseph speak about how stringent these audits, these third party audits are. Um, and one of the requirements is year after year, continuous improvement on, on your sustainability uh, factors. Um, sustainability is not one thing. And I think so far we've done a great job of telling you all that. Um, some of the aspects are water, energy, soil, packaging, uh, people, and ultimately they all come together to create practices that are good for the environment, that are good for the community. Um, and as Lisa said earlier, they're good for our grapes and our wine, and thus they're good for our customers as well. Uh, regarding water, what Wenti does is we have some site-specific irrigation. We use flow meters and evapotranspiration sensors to do precision irrigation. Um, in both our Livermore Valley and our Rio Seco uh, vineyards. And some of the efforts that we take in, on in the winery is we use Blue Morph UV light system, which saves us roughly 150,000 gallons of water per year on our tank sanitations. Um, so we sanitize with UV light. We then treat and reuse our winery wash water, uh, which we're very proud of, um, as Michael just said, he does too. Uh, regarding the soil, we use a no-till system, uh, which is a regenerative farming practice. This keeps the carbon in the soil, and it also uh, means that we get to reduce our tractor emissions because we don't drive tractors to till. Um, we do soil analysis. We do extensive cover crops where, where relevant. That helps the, um, the ecology of those vineyards by promoting biodiversity and microbiodiversity in both the soil and for the insects. Uh, we use owl boxes, raptor perches for natural pest mitigation, and we have 1,600 acres of dedicated open rangeland to help promote that ecological balance. Regarding energy, um, as some of you may know, we were one of the first to partner with Monarch Tractors, which is an electric tractor uh, business. And we're very proud of our work with them. We use STARS filtration in the winery. This is, it essentially instantly cold stabilizes our white wines and our rosé wines. So we don't have to use the energy intensive process of um, traditional cold stabilization. And this year we're installing a brand new bottling line, which we expect to increase our energy efficiencies uh, even further. On the packaging front, uh, what you may or may not know is that packaging is a significant um, component of sustainability. A lot of waste comes from that. And so we're transitioning to lighter weight glass. Uh, we also use a bunch of, uh, as much as we can, recycled cardboard shippers and sales materials. Um, and we're very proud of this fact that we are certified sustainable in the vineyard and winery. And so we're putting it on the front of our white tea vineyards labels in the future. I love this picture of Julio Corrubias. He's been with the business for 50 years. Uh, that's 50 harvests that he's been in our vineyards and he's uh, one of our vineyard managers. Our average tenure is about 10 years for our employees, but you know, there's a few exceptions out there. Um, and uh, Wenti also has a arts foundation in the Bay Area that we um, that we help the community out by by providing support in arts education. We um, we give every employee volunteer uh, paid volunteer hours so that they can help contribute to our local communities, and then we support community based nonprofits across the country. 
Um, some of the areas where we're spending time in the future on continuous improvement are renewable energy. We're investigating solar panels and their uh, viability for us and our business. Uh, carbon farming, so how to sequester more of that carbon and keep it in the soil. Uh, we are undergoing a GHG audit right now. I'm very excited about the outcome of that and where it points us for the future. Uh, strong water conservation efforts, as anybody in California probably is doing. Uh, and investing in our DE&I program. So today, you know, one of the wines that we're kind of showing off is our Charles Wetmore Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, this is from the southeast side, excuse me, west side of the valley by our golf course. Uh, a little picture of the vineyard there. It's, uh, it's a blend, primarily cab, but it uses a couple of the other varieties that grow exceptionally well on those sites. I hope you enjoy it. I certainly am. Delicious wine, beautiful fruit. Boy, Pico Do 11% always adds something special to it. So well done. Thank you, Andy. Much appreciated. And Greg, um, if you could take us to our next stop. Absolutely. So we are going south towards Monterey. Um, one big thing with Monterey is that you have the Monterey Bay. This is an area um, almost two miles deep and 60 miles wide, um, so close to the region. Again, brings that cool air in where we have burgundy varieties planted closer to the ocean. And as you go up the Salinas Valley really brings in more of those, those warmer uh, climate varieties, cooler bodied reds, et cetera. Um, going down into the heart of Monterey, Chai Family Wines, um, definitely one of the classic producers in the valley been at it for a long time and have been doing a uh, stellar job. That Lars back to more. Awesome, thank you very much, Greg. Love seeing all this family involvement. So we have Casey Di Cesare, winemaker at Scheid Family Wines and he's gonna be speaking about their Mets Road. Uh, Casey, I know you grew up in upstate New York. You were born in California, but you grew up upstate New York, fishing in ponds and hiking in woods. And I wonder <laughs> that has an influence on your uh, passion for sustainability. Well, heck yeah, I still want those ponds to be there. So, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, so uh, yeah, I'm Casey DeCedere, uh representing uh, Shad Family Wines. I'm a winemaker here. Uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about our Metz Road uh, brand. Let me share my screen. Cool. All right. So hello again. Thanks again, Lars. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so let's see here. I'll, I'll start off with talking a little bit about Shad as a whole. Uh, so we are a family-owned uh, company, uh, founded in 1972, 50 years strong is our 50th anniversary. Uh, Al just turned 90 this year, so happy birthday, Al. Um, and we want to be around for 50 years more, so obviously sustainability is a big part of that. Um, we started in 1972 as just grape growers and transitioned in the early 2000s to uh, building a state-of-the-art facility. And, and throughout the whole process, you know, being eco-focused, um, environmentally friendly, and sustainability was always a, a big part of that. Um, so we have a wind turbine that actually powers our whole facility and then the equivalent of another 125 homes in the area, uh, which is really cool. Uh, it's really cool when it gets serviced. There's like this tiny guy on the top of a turbine. Um, and we've got a few vineyards that are uh, now uh, transitioning to organic. We have one that's already certified organic. And... Uh, yeah, we, we recycle, reuse all of our water here, um, along with pumice. We've got a number of uh, certifications, um, which you've heard from a few others as well, SIP certified through all the vineyards, uh, third party certified sustainable in both our estate winery and vineyard. Um, and we, we got the Green Medal Award for Environment back in 2019. So another a nice honor for us at Scheid. And uh, I'm just going to take you a little bit through uh, our vineyards here and, and ultimately highlight our review vineyard. Um, so as Greg talked about earlier, we've got that Monterey Bay, um, really uh, gives cooling through the whole valley. We've got these really warm, wind, uh, really powerful winds that go through the valley in every afternoon. Um, and our Riverview vineyard is uh, really influenced by that bay. It's one of our more northern vineyards. A lot of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, we also have a small experimental block up there. Um, and so that's the, the wine I'll be highlighting here. Uh, so the brand is Metz Road. We have an owl on the label. Uh, again, 
you know, it's all about, you know, using technology and nature to have kind of an, as little and minimal impact on um, and, and really highlight terroir. So uh, we have a bunch of owl boxes on the property. We have an owl on the label um, highlighting that. Uh, and really this brand is all about, you know, an essence of place. Um, you know, we've, we've got the, uh, it's a beautiful site. It's right across the San Lucia Highlands, a little bit of ex more exposure from that winds and being on the east side, we get a little bit more sun. Um, and, and, you know, we have some challenges in the vineyard uh, in terms of uh, pest management, and uh, we do as much possible minimal innovation and using minimal intervention and in using our natural environment to our advantage. Um, so we have targeted uh, water management system. So all our guys have an iPad and we have probes throughout the whole vineyard. So we know if somewhere's getting a little less, a little too much. So we can really, obviously, uh, we wanna manage that water as best as possible. Um, we, we heard about olive boxes from others, raptor perches, uh, we like the, the Gabalon mountain range above and the coyotes come down to the vineyard. So we actually put out water buckets for the coyotes to, uh, for pest management. Um, it's really cool walking, uh, driving down the rows and occasionally see a, a coyote growing through, growing through the vines that usually don't walk the vines too much of those days or just <laughs> yell, yell really loud. <laughs> um, we've cover crops, uh, through, uh, you know, increasing biodiversity, improving soil health, um, and uh, another cool technology we have is uh, agrothermal. So it's a uh, it's essentially really hot air that blows through the vines on a short short period. So uh, again, minimizing you know extra passes with any extra chemicals, um, and you know creating it helps with fungal uh, protection and uh, and also with uh, blasting off pest pests. Uh, so to really highlight. You know, we're doing all this work in the vineyard, um, all these sustainable practices, and we really want to highlight that in our wines. Uh, so Mets in particular, uh, we have this a large shop um, down in Greenfield and about 20 miles north in Riverview in our vineyard. We actually have this uh, little uh, refrigerated shipping container, um, and that's where we do our fermentations for this wine. Uh, again, we want to highlight kind of what's terroir, and for me, having that microbe population um, expressing terroir is important. Bringing it to a big vineyard with a lot of commercial yeast, maybe you have other um, players in the mix, but out in the vineyard, we're really highlighting, you know, what's that biodiversity, what, um, what microbes are in the vineyard, and expressing that in our wines. And uh, yeah, so we do a various amount of whole clusters. Again, it's, you know, it's like a bowling lane with, with bumpers, you know, just making sure things don't go too far off path, but, you know, make sure you get a strike right at the end. Um, so, you know, from year to year, depending on, you know, how lignified the, the, uh, the stems are, we'll do a certain amount of whole cluster. Um, we're doing that native fermentation, small lots. Um, we have a lot of different clones out there uh, at uh, Riverview. So again, just kind of highlighting in each clone, you know, it's, it's a blender in itself. So, um, really highlighting the vineyard with clonal selection, uh, whole cluster and uh, native fermentation. So yeah, I, uh, I, I actually ended uh, a minute and a half short there, so. I'm impressed. Hey. I'll, I'll take that minute to compliment your wine. Um, <laughs> I, can, uh, I can see, given this a very slight chill, you know, maybe cellar temperature, so 57, 56, and um, just drinking it all summer long. Those beautiful uh, black cherry raspberry flavors, nice bright acidity, awesome wine. Yeah, you. Sorry you had to go back from those beautiful red blends to Pinot Noir, but you're a pro, so I figured it'd be all right. Well, you know what? It's got the acidity that it wakes up the palate. It certainly was not uh, overwhelmed by anything. It stands up to it. Oh, good, uh, good. And, yeah. and I have to say, looking at, uh, at Mr. Scheid there, um, obviously sustainable, sustainability is doing good if he's looking that good at 90, so... Oh yeah, he's awesome and, and quick as a whip. Yeah, he was he was cracking us up at his 90th party. It was great. <laughs> I love it. All right, Casey, thank you very much. Cool. Thanks so much, Lars. Uh, let's uh, stop share here. I know your mother told you never to stop sharing, but sometimes <laughs> you do that. All yeah, right. That's right. Greg, we got one more stop. Absolutely. We are headed down to Paso Robos, um, just on the eastern side of the Santa Lucia range. Um, but really also having a significant ocean influence as it flows through the Templeton Gap. Uh, 11 different sub-AVAs 
uh, improved in 2014, but really um, all of them have, have such unique characteristics that um, this, this highlighting the individual AVAs, uh, I think is always really stellar. Um, Bordeaux and Rhone varieties, definitely a classic, but uh, more recently Cabernet Sauvignon has taken over as one of the, uh, the top wines of the region. Um, here we have Robert Hall and O'Neill Vineyards and Distillers, um, really doing stellar work and one of the, the classics in, in the region. With that, uh, back to Lars for more. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. So it is my pleasure to introduce Kane Thompson, who is Managing Director of Robert Hall Winery and Sustainability Lead for O'Neill Vintners, also, in, of course, in Paso. Uh, Kane was born in New Zealand, and he developed regenerative viticulture and leads for the, uh, uh, he leads the charge for sustainability at O'Neill. And Kane, I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, good morning, and uh... Yeah, pleasure to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to speaking about sustainability and the various practices and principles we're adopting at O'Neill Vintners and Distillers. But firstly, uh, O'Neill is a family owned, family run. Uh, Jeff O'Neill owns a company and has done uh, for the last 20 years. And we've got eight national brands that are part of O'Neill Vintners and Distillers. And what unites those brands uh, together is sustainability as it's a core part of our focus of what we do. So in the next seven minutes, I'm gonna share with you some of those uh, practices, uh, principles and initiatives that we're working on at O'Neill. So firstly, everything is farmed and made sustainably at O'Neill. We're one of the 10% uh, of wineries where uh, the wineries are CSWA certified and then all of our state vineyards are CSWA certified. And we're also working with uh, over 200 growers uh, across California to convert to sustainable wine growing. At the moment, 85% of our suppliers are CSWA certified and we're working on the balance of the 15% to fall into a CSWA certification as well. So it's a big undertaking. We've got a large uh, grower liaison team that helps our growers with this uh, uh, transformation from conventional to sustainable wine growing because sustainability is at the heart of who we are and what we do uh, at O'Neill. What you're looking at here is uh, the wastewater uh, system at our Palier facility. Uh, this is the largest uh, biofiltro worm powered wastewater system uh, in uh, North America. So these are 12 large Olympic sized uh, beds uh, of worms. Uh, and we put our, our winery wastewater through these worm beds and the worms digest the winery wastewater and turn uh, that into humus. And that humus is a beautiful, rich, vibrant substance uh, that we can then put out uh, into our vineyards. Uh, we have extensive solar installs at both our Palia and then also our uh, Paso Robles Winery at uh, Robert Hall to offset our electricity usage. There are huge uh, components of this and these installs have just been completed in the last couple of years. Uh, we're very uh, honored and proud to receive the uh, Green Medal Leader Award uh, just this year from the Wine Institute. And then we just launched a regenerative uh, farming study in 2020 to compare uh, sustainable production with regenerative uh, farming and a side-by-side -side analysis at reasonable scale at 40 acres in what is one of the first studies of its type uh, anywhere in the world. I'm gonna share a little bit uh, of that uh, with you. So the study was set across 40 acres of Cabernet Savion at our Robert Hall at Vineyard. And the purpose was to really understand uh, everything about regenerative farming from effects on quality, the effect on yield, uh, soil, what effect does it have on the fruit, and then to take that into the uh, winery as well and produce wines uh, side by side. Working with a really well-known uh, biodynamic consultant, so we're uh, adopting the biodynamic principles, uh, Philip Amenier uh, from uh, Chateauneuf de Pap, uh, Domaine Marco, and we're working with, it's a three-year study. And the idea is to track and measure all these various factors across vineyard management and then winemaking uh, combined with uh, what does it cost to farm this way as well. And so we're announcing those uh, results uh, this week and summarizing into a, a like a two-page uh, document as a write-up. But to give you an indication of kind of what we saw through the season, on the left-hand side, you've got the sustainably farmed vineyard. On the right-hand side, you've got the regeneratively farmed vineyard. And this was a common uh, theme that we saw right through the season. 
the sustainable farm area, uh, a very traditional sustainable program um, that we saw a smaller canopy and comparatively to the regenerative uh, lot. And what in Paso, it gets pretty warm. And so what we saw uh, at this stage, just pre-harvest is that the regenerative side had uh, less uh, shrivel or uh, dehydration. So the fruit remained intact for like a longer period leading into, into harvest. Whereas in the sustainable lot, uh, it, we did get um, some shrivel occurring. And we put that down to just the larger canopy. Uh, the leaves acted like uh, an umbrella across the fruit and just allowed more shade on the fruit. It was still open enough uh, to give the light that we need, but just protected that fruit from the, from the hot sun. And so really encouraged by the first year uh, of results. Uh, the farming costs were a little bit higher, about 10%. Uh, the fruit came in uh, pretty much the same. Uh, the regenerative was a little bit uh, less sugar ripe due to less dehydration. Uh, but had a little bit more yield, about 5% uh, more yield, uh, because the berries weren't as uh, de dehydrated. The wines look uh, fantastic from the trial, and we're really encouraged with this. So we've actually decided to convert uh, the rest of the estate, uh, the full 80 acres, into re regenerative farming. We'll continue the trial, the five acres that's uh, farmed sustainably will stay like that, so we can always see uh, where we were and uh, compare and contrast uh, for the next three years and beyond. That's been a fascinating study to be uh, be part of. The wine that we're uh, looking at that Lars has got here, uh, this is our artisan collection, Cabernet Savion. Uh, this is a Paso Robles uh, Cabernet. Uh, the key to this brand is that we source from all 11 EBAs from Paso Robles to get a real true representation of the terroir of Paso. So we can hand on heart talk about uh, uh, Paso Robles and the diversity uh, from those 11 AVAs. It's a great uh, uh, by the glass uh, entry level into Robert Hall. For anyone looking to uh, understand Paso Robles, this is a great place to uh, start. Uh, this is our founding winemaker who's been with us for the last 20 years, who uh, puts this uh, cabinet together across these 11 AVAs. He's been working with these growers for the last 20 years as new growers come in. So he knows Paso Robles like the back of his hand. And so it's a yeah, beautiful, ripe, uh, but balanced uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Rabble Month, this is another one of our uh, brands within the uh, portfolio uh, that uh, O'Neill owns. Uh, this month is uh, Rabble Earth Month. And so for every uh, bottle of wine sold, uh, we are planting one tree with a partnership with One Tree Planted. Uh, last year, uh, we planted 70,000 trees uh, in uh, April, and this year, the goal is for uh, 100,000 uh, trees uh, planted. And then within Rabble Wine Company, outside of the month of April, uh, everything is sustainably farmed uh, across, uh, across the vineyard, sourcing into Rabble. Uh, and then uh, we are part of 1% uh, for the planet uh, for, this, uh, for this brand. And so that's 1% of top line revenue goes to 1% for the planet. And uh, the funding from that goes into environmental based projects uh, across, the, across the US. So it's a really neat uh, organization to be involved with both 1% for the planet and uh, one tree planted. Yeah, and so thank you. There's some examples of uh, some of the sustainability initiatives that we uh, put in place at O'Neill and what we're working on going forward as well. Awesome. Thank you very much, Kane. I got to say, you just showed the picture of Don Brady. I've had the, uh, the pleasure of working with Don on a webinar too, and he is absolute salt of the earth. As you said, knows the uh, property well, knows the territory well, and uh, this is what I love about this panel. Uh, I made a reference earlier to the term greenwashing. Greenwashing is when the, um, the marketing team takes over and, and starts to say, oh yeah, we do this, we do that. But what you can tell here, what we've seen from each and every single panelist is a real genuine effort, uh, really coming from family roots, coming from a, a cause and really bringing things forward. So it's, uh, it's very, uh, very much comes from deep down inside, very much comes from uh, the soul of each of these winemakers. And Lisa, thank you uh, for your organization and its, uh, and its fantastic efforts that it's done to support these efforts by winemakers um, and each of the panelists today for shining light on what true sustainability really is 
Uh, and as I said earlier, what a great time to be a wine lover because we can drink even more and more healthy wines and that is as good as it gets. So uh, thank you all for this wonderful educational opportunity. Um, audience, remember to get your essays in. Uh, Lynn, you wanna give us a reminder of what uh, what's at stake here and what the deadlines are? Yes, so uh, by the end of the day on Monday, you'll receive your essay prompt. Um, we will uh, uh, just make sure to check your spam filter in case you don't get that. Um, but uh, the competition is for $1,000. It's a grand prize. Um, so you're welcome to come back on our website and, and watch this episode again. I think it's incredible what we learned today. Amazing stuff that all of you are doing. It uh, gives me a lot of hope for the future of the wine industry. So, um, but yeah, essays, uh, 500 words or less. Um, and the due date will be uh, May 9th. And we'll let everybody know the winner within about 10 days of that. And uh, good luck to everyone. Fantastic. Thanks, Lynn. And as Lynn pointed out, uh, this has been recorded. It's, been, uh, it's available on Facebook Live on the Psalm Journal platform. Uh, it's on psalmjournal.com as well as psalmfoundation.com. And the printed recap will appear in the, uh, <laughs> my notes say the uh, April, May issue, which is clearly not. It's the August, September issue uh, of the Psalm Journal. And so thank you on behalf of the Psalm Journal, Psalm Foundation, all our producers. This has been the last of our winery close-up series. Stay tuned for hopefully more educational opportunities uh, online and pretty soon we're going to be coming to you live. Can't wait for that. Uh, and remember, if you don't already have a subscription to the Psalm Journal, please email me. Pretty simple email, Lars at psalmjournal.com. Uh, we'd love to have you enjoy our content. So thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the day and happy spring. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.